This is the In the Rabbit Hole episode archive project. What you're about to watch and listen to is a past episode from In the Rabbit Hole Urban Survival Podcast. You can learn more by visiting intherabbithole.com. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel now. And here's two guys that survived camping out in front of the Apple Store, Aaron and Jonathan. Howdy, and welcome to episode 60 of In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. In this episode, we're joined by Lisa Bedford, the survival mom, who's going to teach Jonathan and I about women. We're your hosts, Aaron. And Jonathan. And you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. We're joined today by Lisa Bedford, the survival mom. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you. I guess if you're the survival mom, that would definitely make us the survival hooligans. <laughs> At least you admit it. <laughs> I think we embrace it. We fully we embrace uh, <laughs> our mischief. We know our role. <laughs> <laughs> the community needed us somewhere, I suppose. So what got you into prep? Well, you know, I'm asked that, of course, uh, very often, but I think that for um, most people, and moms especially, prepping is something that we have already always done. Just as, you know, a responsible mom, you make sure your kids have jackets on, or you look outside and maybe it's going to rain today, so you make sure your kids are equipped for that. And when a mom or any American has paid, started paying attention, closer attention to the flow of news, and current events, and putting that together with their own observations around their own communities and their gut instinct. Uh, a few years ago, quite a few of us began to realize, you know, the future is a whole lot more uncertain than it ever has been in my lifetime. And, you know, just as a mom, it made perfect sense to me to do what I was already doing, but just a little more so. So instead of worrying about what's for dinner tonight, I started to think, well, you know, what if all of a sudden our family business went bankrupt? You know, how would I feed the kids? How could I make sure that, you know, we could stay warm in the winter and cool enough in the summer? And, you know, it really is just an extension of what I already did and what moms already do. So it, was, uh, it wasn't a huge step where all of a sudden I was looking for, you know, um, you know to hole up in Idaho somewhere. It was just really just, you know, what can I do where I am, you know, with what we, with what we have. Mm -hmm. have. Have you noticed, because our, our primary focus is generally urban survival, and like you were saying, not running off to, to Idaho, because it just, right. not, not to say one's better than the other, or one's right and one's wrong, it was just, we didn't have an interest in doing it. What do you find are particularly unique about trying to, because you're in, a, in an urban environment as well, from, from what I understand, what do, you, what do you find are the unique aspects of that? Well, the unique aspect is that it isn't very unique, and that actually is helpful. So my experience here in, you know, a suburban setting is very much like, you know, every, you know, the majority of people who are preparedness and survival-minded. Really, very, very few of us will be able to relocate to a, you know, a rural setting or a homestead. That just isn't in the cards for most of us. Mm -hmm. And so instead, you know, we just look at, let's just say the physical, um, you know, just the home, you know, our physical setting. Well, what can we do to make our home more secure? What could we do, you know, if we have to evacuate? What are the routes out of, you know, out of town or even to a safer part of town? And it's just, it all has the mind, boils down to the mindset of we can only do what we can do, but actually um, we are all in a lot more control over our future than we realize. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that is that, you know, and I think that's funny. People coming in to survival typically feel out of control because it's mm -hmm. something has prompted them that something that is seemingly out of control, something they're very concerned with, it's prompted them to get into survival so that they can tank control. And I think after a while that we all kind of realize we do have more control than we first thought. Right. And I think that's been a, a key factor for our show, Lisa, and which is really about guiding people into the, sh into the uh, general prepper lifestyle and telling them that they can take control, giving them a few tools to be able to take control. And 
one of those things we talk about a lot is when you first started. So, so we always talk about the mistakes we made. What are some of the mistakes you made when you first started, just to give our listeners an idea of things to avoid? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that the, the very first step to take, the correct step to take, is just being more aware and more informed. So the flip side of that is that you can actually become too informed. Um, <laughs> early, yep. Maybe you can relate to that. You know, early in the journey when your eyes are finally opened and you're like, oh my gosh, this is happening at a, you know, a federal level. This is happening on a worldwide level. This is what I see happening around me. You know, these are, you know, rumors that I've seen or this law has just been passed. And there are so many things that can alarm you that it's easy to fall into a, uh, just a, really an information overload to the point where you just freeze. And so there were times when I would become just, you know, so fearful. I really was checking on uh, land up in Montana. And I was looking at these house listings that claimed to be, you know, safe from rifle fire up to, you know, so many thousands of yards. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was thinking that was a pretty good idea. And so one day my husband came home and I had been um, getting a lot of my information from survival blog. And he took the very unusual step of telling me that he was forbidding me to ever go to that <laughs> site again. <laughs> and we have, a pretty, we have a pretty equitable marriage. And it was like, you're, you're forbidding me? You know, I can't go to that anymore, Dad. You know, you're not my dad. Mm. And, but, you know, what he was seeing was I just was really becoming just way overloaded with it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as a mom, anything at all that um, threatens our home threatens our little brood, you know, we take that seriously. Right. And last year I had a chance to interview a man who has taught, um, oh, all kinds of firearms classes and all kinds of self-defense. And he said, you know, when I talk to a class of women and I ask them, what would you do to protect your kids? He said, their entire, everything about them, you know, their countenance changes, their body changes, you know, the, it just, you know, there's just a complete change that comes over them physically. And I think that that was what was steering me in the direction of survival is that, you know, whatever it ever came down to me being the main one protecting my kids, what would I do? And it just seems so much smarter to become informed now and to be prepared now for that. But uh, as far as mistakes go, the information overload is one. And then also maybe jumping in in too many areas at once. So Mm -hmm. we plowed right into food storage without having any information. And it wasn't long before, you know, there were little bugs showing up in some potato flakes that I bought. And, you know, there was the realization, you know, do I really want to stock up on that much ravioli? You know? <laughs> and so that was something else is just, um, you know, it really is better to become informed, but then also take smaller steps. And then as you see what is suitable for your family, you know, what, you know, what does make sense for my family, then, you know, putting a little more effort into it. Well, that's fantastic. And I think that's, you know, I think that's very similar to the journey as we came to, to find it. And I think we even did a show yep. a couple of weeks back about information junkies, which is essentially information overload and can also be described as analysis paralysis that <laughs> that does tend to happen as we first get into prep and get excited about it and, and all that fun stuff. But- and, and we could share those same stories about jumping in with uh, <laughs> both feet, arms and head first. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. you, you know, like us, you've got a show and everything, and but you started off with a blog. Tell us what what made you decide to what were, what was your driving force to get you into starting to communicate and reach out to kind of I guess the rest of cyber world. You know, for me, it was um, you know I don't really know. I don't really know. I had been researching this. We had taken steps to start. Um, Oh, our own food storage and, the, you know, things that we thought made sense as far as, you know, uh, home security and personal security. And, um, but what really started me writing it, I, don't, I think I was honestly bored. And kind of the funny story behind the blog was that my husband was in the middle of a huge home renovation project. And that limited how much of our home I had access to on any given day. <laughs> so I had a lot of time on my hands. And now when I go back to see what I wrote those first, you know, four or five months, I was a writing machine because I didn't have anything else to do. And it was just um, coming to the realization, part, you know, one realization I had early on was that there really wasn't information out there geared too specifically toward women. And it wasn't that we couldn't glean an awful lot of good stuff from these forums and websites and blogs 
they were written by men because a good chunk of their traffic does come from women. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, I had questions that were maybe a little more closer to my heart or, you know, closer to home. You know, how do I talk to my kids about this? You know, what does make sense without going overboard? And that was the kind of information that I was looking for. And as I began to do those kinds of things and learned what worked and what didn't work, then um, I was a teacher for so many years and I wrote curriculum and I was a trainer and I owned a business for many years. So to me, this was just, it was such a natural uh, next step for me as far as, you know, kind of establishing some kind of a, you know, a presence um, in a, you know, in a business sense, I just was like, oh, this is going to be my new hobby from now on. Mm-hmm. Um, but they really, they truly needed to be uh, a very um, kind of a fairly loud voice for women and saying, you know, it's okay, you know, to worry. It's okay to have these fears. And, you know, here, you know, come along with me and let's you know, work on this together. Lisa, what are... Um uh, the focus on women, I think, is great because y- you're right. We we can only speak to it here from our point of view, and we don't have that point of view particularly. Uh, you know, we could fake it, but that's about as best we can do. Um, what are some of those unique uh, issues that women face when they prep? You know, I think one of them is um, finding balance and just you know, coming to terms with the fact, you know, what would I do to protect my kids? What would I do to protect my home? And that is something that, you know, the protection part, I think, comes very naturally to men. So when you go to these other sites, it isn't surprising at all when you see there's a big, strong emphasis on, you know, firearms and how to reload ammo and what kind of ammo for this kind of gun. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've, you know, we've pimped up our, our rifles, you know, <laughs> take a look at it and, you know, all of that. And that's all fine and good. But um, I think a part of that then comes to moms and we have to think, okay, you know, do I want to have guns in the house? Do I want to learn how to shoot? And so, you know, we have to cons- take those things, the same things into consideration. But women have been conditioned for so long to shun anything that has to do with firearms or to believe that they are ruining their children's lives, you know, if they even, ha- you know, have, uh, let them have a toy gun. So I think one challenge is to think about, well, you know, protection doesn't mean, you know, do firearms make sense? How would I incorporate that? You know, can I learn how to shoot myself? I really had never even ventured into the world of firearms before I got into preparedness. Um, another thing is that we look at our kids and we know them better than anyone else. And we know what scares them at night. We know when they've had a bad dream. And we don't want them to get so wrapped up in this new perspective that we have where they too are affected. Mm-hmm. And so that's where the nurturing, you know, that, you know, it just comes naturally to moms. That's where the nurturing comes into. And I'm not going to find that. It's survival blog. Sorry. You know, I love, you know, James Rawls and I really respect him. But, you know, the whole idea of, you know, nurturing our kids and how do we lead them along into an, a mindset of uh, not so much survival, but self-reliance. Mm-hmm. And so that is something that uh, just comes, I think, so naturally to women. And yet what we're trying to do midstream, Aaron and Jonathan, is that midstream, we're trying to get back to that mindset and that perspective of our great grandmas. Oh, yeah. And all the grandmas that came before them. Because in my lifetime, um, survival has been something that I never spent a moment thinking about. And now all of a sudden I'm thinking, you know, I do want to grow our own food. I do want to know how to make clothes. I do want to know how to mend, you know, socks and do these things that my grandma and great grandma knew how to do. But I'm doing that midstream here in a 21st century world where the latest, you know, the hottest item in the news is, you know, what's new with the iPad. (laughs) And so we're really swimming against that, uh, that very heavy cultural stream in a lot of ways as well. Yeah, and finding that balance can be tricky. I know, uh, joking about iPads, Jonathan and I were just sitting here before the show talking about the new iPad, Mm -hmm. and it is interesting to try to find that balance between old world skills and acquiring those skills and the trials and tribulations of trying to acquire those skills and balancing that with staying in the moment and staying on top of all the, the tools and resources that while as in survival, it's often shunned, but the the new tools that are available. I mean, the iPad right. is a tool if used properly. It's not just a, a a way to play Angry Birds or something. 
Right. But right. hey, that's what I'm doing right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> actually, not playing angry, but but that whole idea of yeah, using the modern technology as a tool to actually help mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. all these things is great. I mean, Absolutely. you were talking about information overload. Well, being able to organize information and review information, um, some of these tools make that a lot easier. Lisa, one of the things you mentioned was uh, interacting with children and making your children feel comfortable. Can you just give us, and maybe an example is the best way to do it. I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. But what is a good way to begin addressing these issues with your children without scaring them? I know, you know, we may touch on the topic of how to get a reluctant spouse on board. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this applies to that scenario as well. And I think one of the easiest ways, two, two easy ways, one of the easiest ways for both, you know, reluctant spouses and family members as well as children is to look for hobbies that have a survival purpose to them. So, for example, camping. I think one of the best things that a family can do and the, one of the best ways to teach your kids not just wilderness skills, but also just kind of the concept of here we are. We're out in the middle of nowhere. You know, what do we do for water? I have to go down to that stream and, you know, fill this bucket with water? You know, and what do I do when I have to go to the bathroom? Really, Mom? You know, there's a bucket behind a tree. That's really, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> so often, you know, if there is ever, you know, a, a time where the grid is down for a prolonged period of time or, you know, times can just get very, phys you know, rough in a physical sense for Americans, as far as our comforts are concerned, that is just the kind of mindset and adaptations that we're going to have to make. So if you look for hobbies, enjoyable things to do as a family, my gosh, uh, amateur radio, what kid would not be fascinated? with talking to people all over the world, all over the country, mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, linking up with other families. And um, another one would be uh, gardening. You know, what can we grow this season, kids? And then once you have, you know, some produce that you're bringing in, you know, let's all learn how to can. Let's all learn how to make jelly, just like Grandma did. Let's learn how to, you know, dry our own foods. Let's learn how, you know, if you're going, you know, hunting, fishing. So all of these kinds of hobbies, really, they have an underlying goal of, just learning skills that would help you and your family be more self-reliant. And then taking that, you know, just a little bit further with children is that children are just very naturally interested in animals. You know, my, my son is 10, and yet he has yet to get over this fascination with anything to do with animals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talk about what, you know, just observe through your own observation or reading, you know, what do animals do when, you know, when the seasons change? You know, what do we know about, you know, animals going into hibernation? What do we know about birds, you know, and how they build their nest and where they build them? And, you know, and I think just looking for examples in nature, again, of, you know, survival. You don't even have to mention that word, though, but just learning. And then all of a sudden, maybe a little bit of food storage, it kind of does make sense. Um, and then as kids get a little older, then, oh, actually, let me backtrack just for a second, um, with all ages of kids, looking for examples in children's literature. And I was a teacher for a number of years. And so, you know, I've always kind of uh, had an eye out, you know, for good kids' literature. And when you read um, Farmer Boy, for example, by Laura Ingalls Wilder, mm -hmm. that is an example of just an, a family that was amazingly self-reliant. And uh, all the Little House on the Prairie books, as well as, you know, there's a great book called Sign of the Beaver. And you can just look for books on, you know, uh, examples, you know, of life in the Great Depression. There's an American Girl book, an American Girl series, in fact, of a character who grew up in the Great Depression. And because our kids need to know that life is usually not nearly as easy as we have it here. And most of the people around the world, they actually lead a far more physically uncomfortable life than we do. Oh, absolutely. And so when you have examples, just in kids' literature, kind of, it kind of makes them realize, you know, first of all, how blessed they are. That's a big thing. But then also that, you know what, maybe we should learn how to do some of these things and how to pick up on some of these skills. And for older children and then, of course, you know, dealing with adults who are not survival-minded are just examples in um, current events. And so taking a look and saying, you know, we, we may not live in Tornado Alley, but how, what would we do? How would we get ready for that? And just family discussions, you know, because you'd be surprised how creative kids can be and how they can think of, you know, solutions that their parents might never, that might not occur to us. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you look for, you know, for modern day examples and look for stories in children's literature and, you know, incorporate fun hobbies. Oh, kids, this time, you know, we're going to go hiking. 
And then they realize, you know, what all, you know, what's involved when you go hiking or camping, as I mentioned before. Those are some really great suggestions. And I think, um, Jonathan, I don't have any children yet, but I think Jonathan, you're coming up on it soon and I'll, I'll get there eventually. I mean, that's, that's definitely fantastic information and, and a very natural way of leading children into think into preparedness. And, you know, kind of talking about children as far as like moms that are finding it hard to maybe make ends meet because survival, getting into survival can be a rather expensive venture, especially when you're still in the point of information overload (laughs) and, you know, looking at places in Montana or the insanity, John, where John and I were looking at dual citizenships and, and that kind of shenanigans. Yeah. How does that work for, for moms or even single moms for that matter that are trying right. to, to get, uh, get prepared? You know, just as I can kind of almost hesitate giving this as an, as an advice, but I think that a smart thing to do is to look at your standard of living and think, you know, what could we do without? Because when it comes to, let's say, a job loss, when it comes to something like that, um, all of a sudden, you know, everyone has to give up maybe the cell phone they have with all the frills. They have to give up the smartphone or they have to, you know, uh, start buckling down and, okay, you know, what can we, you know, eliminate from our, our budget? And I think for not, not every family, I mean, a lot of families are just barely scraping by. But if your family is, you know, if your way of life hasn't changed a whole lot and yet you are survival-minded, single mom or, you know, a whole entire you know, family with a bunch of kids, you know, start looking now. You know, how could we change our lifestyle now where we're not so dependent on gadgets, where we have fewer bills going out, and uh, just see, you know, what, you know, what changes can we do? And so for a lot of us that use a debit card pretty often, it's a pretty simple matter of just, you know, logging into you know, the bank's website and just going through expense by expense by expense. You know, what can we, you know, eliminate completely? You know, is there anything here that we can, um, you know, minimize, expenses that we can minimize? And a lot of moms are, got, you know, they become very creative when they're, you know, they're using grocery store coupons. And all of that comes together because you're right, it is hard to be prepared um, <clears throat> when you can't buy anything extra other than just barely enough soup to get in rice, you know, to get you through the week. Mm-hmm. But kind of hand in hand with that is uh, the understanding, and this may be a lifesaver to some families who um, are really struggling with, with their, you know, family's uh, economics, and that is what do you know how to do? What skill sets do you have right now? And expand on those. And it actually is very surprising between YouTube and between outdoor stores like REI or Cabela's um, and, you know, any store that kind of caters to any kind of a hobbyist. It's amazing how much free education is out there. So the REI store by us, they regularly have, you know, workshops on how to, you know, become your own bicycle mechanic, for mm-hmm. example. Yeah, we've got that and, too. I'm sorry? We've got that as well. So I think that's yeah. pretty standard throughout the REIs. Yes. And, you know, what, you know, because there could come a day, you know, oh, and first aid, first aid skills, medical skills, you know, spruce up on what you know about, you know, old time, you know, remedies, herbal remedies, you know, start growing your own, you know, medicinal herbal garden and learning, you know, this kind of tea, you know, takes care of colic or, you know, this can, you know, do the, you know, a stomach ache or a cough because at some point, medical care is going to become far more expensive than it is now. Oh, people absolutely. think it's expensive or it's not easily accessible. Just wait. Yeah. You know, just wait. Not only the government changes that are coming, but I don't think that economically America is in for some huge um, uh, renaissance as far as, you know, our standard of living goes. And so, you know, if my kid is colicky or if my kid, you know, has, you know, burned themselves or whatever, you know, what would it be worth to me? If you had the capability of taking care of that, it would probably be worth a bucket of wheat. It might be worth a case of freeze-dried food. And so for families that are struggling, I just suggest take an inventory. What do you already know how to do? What are some hobbies that you've had that you can even, you know, further your education in? You know, my husband isn't a hunter. You know, what I have a feeling that if we ever were desperate for meat, he would be more than willing to either go hunting with someone or pay them in some form or another, some kind of a barter transaction, you know, to bring back, you know, a, a deer for us or whatever. So mm-hmm. 
I think that, you know, both, you know, kind of, uh, boosting your, you know, your knowledge base and boosting your skills could actually become a way to earn money, you know, now as well as in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's absolutely true. And I think that's one of the things we've always preached is find, find things that make your life better today, as well Mm -hmm. as if things go wrong, because if things don't go wrong, then all you did was make your life better now. So it doesn't become this where you're just doing it in the expectation of some sort of collapse or calamity. Right. We try to drive it. There's always an upside to prepping, whether it's today or tomorrow, there's always an upside. Yeah. So an interesting question for you, since most of the emails we typically get are from men trying to convince women to get into prep. How do you, do you get that on your side where you find women trying to convince men to get into prep? I do. And that actually is kind of funny because all the time that I was spending on these, you know, male dominated forums and so on, it really was making women look bad. Yeah. You know, like, you know, my girlfriend's oblivious and she doesn't want anything to do with this or my wife or whatever. And so I was thinking, man, you know, what is it with these women? Mm -hmm. Until I started getting a lot of comments on my blog and emails saying, I just can't convince my husband to get into this. (laughs) And so it really, it's on both sides. Yeah. A couple of things that are interesting is that women by far make up the majority of book purchases. Hmm. And so uh, one way to perhaps, you know, get someone interested might be with my book (laughs) because it is written for women. And I know there are other books out there, but, uh, you know, women are just the major book purchases as well as the main shoppers. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the kind of the comparison that I make or the thought that I've had is that, you know, a man can come home and say, you know, honey, we're going to start stocking up on, you know, food. You know, we need to have, you know, three months. We need to have six months. If she's not on board, if she's the one who usually does all the shopping, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. And it really is. I mean, your family can do so much more toward preparedness. When mom's on board, dad's on board, and even kids, you know, when they're kind of enthusiastic about learning how to camp or whatever. So <clears throat> what can be done is, um, again, just going back to the hobbies, you know, mm-hmm. you know, why don't we, you know, we've always wanted, you know, talked about, you know, taking a, you know, a two week camping trip, you know, why don't we do that? And really what's kind of interesting is in the process of that specific example is that you're going to have to buy something to cook food on, right? You're going to have to cook, you know some kind of a rocket stove or something or other. Well, now you have a backup cooking system in case you ever need it at home. And you start learning how to cook off the grid. Well, cooking off the grid is just a very important um, skill as well as just a piece of knowledge in case there's ever a time when the grid goes down. Mm -hmm. Or you just want to save money because uh, electricity has become so astronomically priced, which is likely to happen. So what the one thing is just to, again, look for just fun activities mm-hmm. and, and do that. And another one is preppers are just really in the news right now. Oh, yeah. And I think that a lot of times people might be surprised, whether it's a spouse or a girlfriend or whatever, they might be surprised what's actually going on in someone's mind. And there are enough scenarios out there and the whole doomsday thing is being promoted enough that um, on one hand, unfortunately, because it's kind of hyped a little too much, oh, it yeah. can be a turn off. Mm-hmm. And then also using just examples. You know, if you live in, you know, where think about what types of freakish weather events could happen in your area. Mm-hmm. Think about what kind of natural disasters your area is prone to. Because it's not insane. If you live in Texas, it is not, you know, more parts, some parts more than others. It is not insane to ask yourself, what would we do if the drought is as bad as it was last year. What would we do if we had to deal with a wildfire? Right. We use so a hurricane as a sense. we use yes. hurricanes <laughs> as a ready example. Yeah, oddly mm-hmm. we've got hurricanes and wildfires. And droughts. And droughts, yeah. <laughs> and we're expected to have the droughts for quite a long time. I think it's gonna start looking uh Texas is gonna start looking more like Arizona soon. Yeah. Last year it was just the photos, you know, and I know that they look for the most dramatic ones. But well, of course. There were a lot of sad photos that came out of Texas. Yeah. Yes, there were. And it's it's not expected to get a better anytime soon. But I think going back to kind of the more the men and women issues that come into play in prep, what do you find it just as common that women that are interested in prep and, and dealing with a spouse that's reluctant to get into to prep, do you also find that to be true with with firearms. Mm. Well, you know what? I think that, and I could be wrong, and please, you know, I, I really like to hear your perspective. 
Because my, uh, from my point of view, when there's an interest in survival and there's a, an awareness that there are some things that menace your family, that menace your home, um, I think it's the natural inc- inclination for men to first start thinking about uh, how they're going to protect and then also, they're, most of them are pretty much concern, you know, consumed with providing for their families. Mm-hmm. I think those I are hope fair. That's not, no, those are it, fair okay. assessments. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, then, whatever doesn't fall into those two categories, then, is what the women worry about. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the bulk of things. <laughs> <laughs> the bulk of things. I wasn't going to come out and say that, but yes. So everything else. <laughs> but again, you know, one of your first questions was, you know, how did I get, you know, from where I am now to where I was. And it just, no, and I, my, I, my answer was, was just a natural progression. Mm-hmm. And so where, when it comes to firearms, I just, I, again, you know, because as men, you're already battling what the culture has set up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the culture has taught that guns are bad and I would never have a gun in my house. So it's not so much that it's his girlfriend or wife. It is that this conditioning that has been going on for the last 50, 60 years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what can be done? I would just say for, for a guy, for that just to be your hobby, if your wife or girlfriend is flat out against it, just have that be your hobby. But then make sure that you, that you invite her along. I grew up in a home with guns. There was never a time growing up that my dad ever suggested to me, hey, Lisa, why don't you come out? Hmm. And so, you know, when my husband and I got married, I think there was maybe once or twice that he went out shooting. And I don't know if he invited me to come along or not, but I don't really, I don't remember that. You know, he's sitting here and he may have another opinion, but <laughs> I don't really remember, you know, ever just someone saying, you know, you really should learn how to do this. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think sometimes maybe men are just afraid of their wives or girlfriends as it should be. But... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm often afraid of my wife having a gun. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, I think that, you know, just maybe once in a while, you know, say, honey, I think, you know, if I ever was gone for a while, if I ever had to, you know, go out of town for something, I would want you to know how to fire a shotgun, Mm -hmm. you know, and you know what, there is just enough of that mama bear in most mothers that she may not jump on board right away, but she's going to be thinking about it. Mm Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, one of the questions, one of the issues that we've run into is where the mother is concerned that the child is going to be mistaken for a burglar or something. And I think Mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. you know, that that same mama bear instinct can tends to, or at least Mm -hmm. in our experience, kind of comes out in both directions, either, yeah, we need to do it or no, you're going to be the bumbling fool that shoots our child. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, what is kind of amazing is the number of firearms that are out there in America. And how few truly, truly, true shooting accidents ever happen. Right. Oh, yeah. When they do, and it's a true accident, it makes the news. I mean, it's on Huffington Post. Mm-hmm. And it makes the news everywhere. <laughs> because it's so, you know, because it is so rare. Mm-hmm. It's the dramatic. So it don't happen every day. And it's very unusual for some kid to truly accidentally shoot another kid. Mm-hmm. And when you, you know, when you look at those statistics and you look at how many guns are in how many households, it's a miracle. It really is. It's actually kind of almost a miracle that there aren't these accidental shootings, you know, every day of the week across the United States, you mm-hmm. know, and to the point where we get bored. You know, we don't pay much attention when a 16-year-old gang member shoots a 17-year-old gang member. It happens often enough depending on where you live. Um, unfortunately, those stats are lumped in, you know, with some five-year-old kid accidentally firing a gun and shooting a seven-year-old neighbor. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all under, you know, children shooting. Well, no, I'm sorry, a 16-year-old gang member, way different. Yeah. You know, from a little kid. What was it? There's lies, damn lies, and then statistics. Yep. Yes. Yeah. But I think um, I am, I've been meaning to write an article because I consider that the shotgun is, I, I'm going to call it the queen of home defense. Oh, I would completely agree. Yeah, uh-huh. we would not argue. You don't recover that. from a shotgun blast to the chest. No. Right. So that is, I, uh, you know, that was just one thing that I w- would want, you know, my kids to learn. Um, and then, you know, with, where children are concerned, I'll tell you how we've approached it. And I would give ourselves, you know, a, a pat on the back for doing this right. We, we don't do everything right. But our kids are, have two things. Number one, they are very trained and educated in how to load a gun and how to fire a gun. Mm-hmm. And all the safety rules that go along with it. 
On the other hand, they are both completely bored with guns. Really? Because it's normal, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's nothing yeah. special. You put them through apple seed, didn't you? We did. We did apple seed. They had both taken um, a rifle shooting class. It was a week long, like a camp mm-hmm. at the shooting range. And they've gone early on. We did the um, Eddie Eagle program to the NRA. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they have a, a dad who's just very, very gun savvy. And then also, this is what I love. when you, If you do take your kids shooting to a range, <laughs> they will make a mistake one time. Because it's no fun being yelled at by a range master. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've seen adults, you know, kind of cower, you know, <laughs> after that. And it's nice because then you have a gun, you know, the, the range master then also training your kids mm-hmm. on safety steps. But um, the worst thing a parent can do is to pretend that, go- that guns don't exist. Oh, yeah. And they're glamorized everywhere kids see them. And when your child, even as a teenager or young adult, does see a gun and has no idea you know, the safety rules for that, that is an accident that could very easily happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's, that's wonderful stuff. And to kind of go into, you know, we kind of started off with like mistakes and stuff, but what, and we even talked about the pitfalls that we all experience when we first get into survival, but what would you say are the most important steps anyone wanting to get prepared would be? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's assume that that person is already aware and they've uh, become, you know, they have, in their own minds, they have some reasons for preparing, whether it's because they live in the Houston area or for whatever reason, they sense an ex- economic collapse or whatever, you know, their motivation is. Um, once that's established, the next step really is to just become uh, informed through a variety of sources. Don't get all of your information just from one blog or one book, or one forum, okay? So pick up information lots of different places. Start developing, you know, what we call a survival library. You know, look for a a book or two, a really good book or two on food storage. Look for, you know, a book on, you know, how to, you know, um, harden your home. Or there's, I have a a download on my blog. I think it's called 32 Books for Your Survival Library. And it's just a free download that you can get. But that would be one place to start is to start gathering information and then just being proactive in the three main areas. Start here first, and that is in the area of water. Learn how to store, you know, different ways to store water. And then have on hand three or four different ways to purify water. The second category is food. Start putting together plans for, you know, specifically if you're looking at uh, a time of a natural disaster or severe weather, look for look to stock up on foods that do not need refrigeration and don't need cooking. If there ever is a catastrophe that is so big that you're going to need to rely on food storage, there's a very good chance you may not be able to cook. And this, uh, and then also at the same time under food storage is look for ways and start start growing in a very small way just your own, uh, even tomatoes, herbs, mm-hmm. you know, start small. And my husband likes to say that small steps are better than no steps at all. That's sound advice. So, yeah. And then the third category would be shelter. You know, if the power went out, um, how would you stay warm when it's, you know, 40 degrees outside, when it's 30 degrees outside, how are you going to stay warm under those circumstances safely? How are you going to stay cool enough when the temperature is, you know, 112 outside with some humidity? You know, how are you going to keep your home safe if there's ever a time when crime is just, uh, you know, on the rise because of desperate people in difficult situations? Mm -hmm. So you take a look at your water, your food, shelter. And that would be a really good place to start if that's what people focused on. They spent six months focusing on, you know, becoming informed and looking at those three initial areas they would be way far ahead of, you know, than probably 80, 90% of the population. Mm-hmm. Some great uh, bullet points for getting started. So you mentioned information and you brought up that you have a book. Co- what made you write a book? Um, you know, the blog, I've had so much fun with the blog over the years and it has 700 and some posts and I recently deleted about 150 uh, just to kind of streamline it. But the blog, you do have to, it's kind of like a gold mine. You know, if you're searching here and then you click on this blog post and you click over here and, you know, it's just, but it's scattered. And so I would get a lot of questions, you know, well, tell me exactly, you know, what are the steps for food storage? 
you know, exactly what do I do, in the, you know, with this scenario. And I realized that as much as I love the blog, it really wasn't enough on its own. What I needed was one volume, preferably indexed, which my book is, that has information that covers many different categories. And is this kind of maybe an all-in-one? Definitely, it's not the only survival book you're ever going to need, but it's, I wanted something that was pretty darn complete. And so I cover um, all the basics. You know, we do touch on, you know, personal and home mm. safety. I go into detail on how to set up an own, your own safe room. You don't have to be, a, you know, a millionaire or Jodie Foster, <laughs> you know, to have a safe room in your house. And, you know, I talk about firearms. I was really blessed with a, um, I've heard of some publishers who just won't even let a writer, you know, talk about firearms. Really? And yeah, there was one of my friends, you know, she put some tips together and her book has been published and it's doing very well, but uh, her particular publisher wanted her to remove everything that had to do with guns. Oh, wow. So oh. I have a section in my book, um, forget the chapter number, but I go through, you know, rifles and shotguns and handguns and you know, details on each and how to learn and safety tips. But also, of course, you know, going into water and food storage. I have two chapters on food storage. And, you know, and how to connect. How do you connect with other people? Because the worst thing about this, you guys have each other. (laughs) But, you know, for many people, most preppers, I would say, unless it's someone online that they chat with, there's no one in real life that thinks the way they do, or at least that they know Mm. of. Right, there's that perceived... uh sense of being on an island. Uh-huh. So, so Lisa, there are a lot of survival books out there and you know, we I think a lot of our readers have seen a lot, but what sets your book apart? Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's the only book that comes from the perspective of a prepper mom, a woman mm-hmm. who is writing for other women. And so, when you read my book, it's not in the same style as other survival books out there. So, you know, I kind of write the way I talk and it is just, in fact, my agent told me early on, he said, I just really like your tone. I need your tone to come out. And it is just a very friendly style. And guys, um, I think there's enough technical information in there. You know, I mean, I've gotten some reviews, you know, that guys have written and emailed me about. But it's written kind of in a way of like maybe a, um, a women's magazine. <laughs> you know, you sit down and, you know, it's humorous at times. And it's just, it's just different. It has a whole different feel to it. And the design of the book was very important to me because I wanted the blog, going back to the blog for a moment, I wanted the blog to be something where a mom could check in, read, you know, she has five minutes, she has, you know, eight, ten minutes, and she can pick up something really helpful. I avoid really long 2,000 plus word articles. I don't want something in there that long. I don't have time to read it. And so I figure if I don't have time to read it, then most other moms don't either. So when the, uh, we were talking about the design of the book, I wanted it to be such that you could open the book to any page and there's something that catches your eye there, whether it's a quote over in the sidebar, or maybe it's a chart, or maybe it's a checklist, or maybe it's a little box that has a tip in it for something. I really wanted it to be, you know, uh, just, you know, an, I, a new idea every time you open the book. You don't necessarily have to read it, you know, starting on page one all the way through page 300. It also has a fantastic, if I can brag for a second, it has a do. fantastic um, appendix in the very back. And so that's where I stuck things like checklists for getting ready for a hurricane, checklists for getting ready for an earthquake, or uh, I have some recipes in the far back, including one for uh, making a protein. This may not appeal to you if you're a carnivore, but you actually can make something that slightly resembles meat, except you make it out of a wheat product. And so it's like a vegetarian wheat or oh. meat. And I stuck that back there just because it's just one more way to use wheat, which a lot of people uh, stock up on. Mm-hmm. So the book is fun. And I, don't, and I think for guys, if they have reluctant girlfriends or wives or mothers or whatever, um, it might be just, just enough information in just the right style to get, uh, get her on board. I think that's fantastic. And you mentioned that you obviously wrote it from a mom's perspective. Why do you think it's so important to reach out to mothers in the way that you do? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that, uh, I, I think that first of all, family survival begins in the heart of a mom. Mm-hmm. So I did not, if I was single, I don't know that I would have done any of this, to be honest with you. I don't know. You know, I haven't, I've been married for, I don't even know how many years anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Figured out, honey. We got married in 1995. So whenever that was, 
17 years, I think, this June. Um, if I was single, I don't think that I would have the same perspective because as a mom, you don't just worry about yourself and your well-being. You know, in fact, you come after the kids, in fact. And you, we worry about, you know, well, let's just look at the example in the news, you know, there's a news talking about bullying, you know, kids bullying other kids in school or on Facebook or whatever. And, you know, the moms get up in arms about that. So our instinct is to protect. I mean, that is just such a deep instinct. It runs, you know, who knows how, I mean, in my book, I say that, you know, even before you get pregnant, you worry about taking folic acid and you start taking the vitamins before you, you know, you're just thinking about, well, I want to, you know, have a baby, you know, this year. And you start taking your care of yourself a little bit differently, not really for yourself, really for that new little baby. Mm -hmm. So Lisa, there's a lot of our listeners right now thinking, okay, my wife, my children, I really want to read this book, or I would like my wife to read mm -hmm. this book. Where can they get your book? Mm -hmm. You know, if they can't wait, <laughs> they can, if you just cannot wait, you can go to a lot, not a lot of bookstores. Barnes & Noble, I know, is carrying it. Um, IndieBound is carrying it, Books A Million. Uh, there might be some independent bookstores in your town. Just call and ask. And it's available at Barnes & Noble online, as well as Amazon online. Okay. Is it in ebook or is it in you know, uh, print um, form? Okay, well, I'm glad you asked that. It's available in Kindle, and I think the Kindle version comes out, I believe, April 1st. Great. Okay. I had some people complaining. But the, my book has checklists and charts. Mm -hmm. And at the end of each chapter, there are forms to fill out, and it's called The Prepared Family. Mm -hmm. And so we touch on sanitation and water all the way through. So at the very end, if you want to have an actual written plan for your family, uh, the paper, the hard copy, is going to be a better bet than the Kindle. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. You can't yeah. print off the Kindle. That's great. So how else would uh, people stay in touch with you and keep up, up to date with your blog and everything else that's going on with right. you? Right. Well, the blog is thesurvivalmom.com. I teach uh, weekly free webinars on all kinds of topics related to survival. I have one coming up later this month on the subject of water storage. And I have some, I have a calendar. You can just go and click on, there's a, a red, bright red button at the top of my blog that'll take you to the calendar. And I'm going to be speaking at three popular mechanic events that are coming up. One is in March, toward the end of March in Northwest Arkansas. And I have one in Houston. And I have one coming up in New Orleans. And I'll be speaking at a self-reliance expo in May, May 18 and 19 in Colorado Springs. So I'm trying to get around the country and, you know, meet people face to face as well as talk about, you know, such, uh, you know, things that uh, every mom and every family and dad for that matter are concerned about. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fantastic, Lisa. And we really want to say we appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your perspective on survival with us. Yeah. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. This has been an episode from the In the Rabbit Hole Urban Survival Podcast. You can learn more by visiting intherabbithole.com. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great survival stuff.